see that number of children. And that's just kids that are from kindergarten into, uh, I guess, you know, fifth grade and even younger than that. It's not even including our youth, uh, college students, or anything like that. So a huge blessing just to be able to have those uh, here this morning. Um, but as you get your Bible open, turn open to Psalm chapter 13, the 13th Psalm. I've got a couple of special people here this morning uh, with me. Um, probably going to, I know one will probably just kill me if I mention her name, and I'm going to anyway, because um, I love her and I think she's great. She just turned 80, 65, she just turned 65, uh, just kidding. Um, grandma, my, uh, my dad's mom is here this morning with us, which is huge. Um, you can just wave your hand if you want to, Grandma. Um, I love Grandma to death. She's sweet. Uh, I remember uh, growing up watching, watching Braves games with her. Uh, she's probably one of the biggest Atlanta Braves fans that you'll see. Probably still watches the games and probably knows more about it than many of us guys, which is huge. But we spent many a days over at her, at her house, and she fed us liver mush by the brick, um, which was pretty great. And... <laughs> If you don't know what that is, then have her cook, cook you some up. It'll be, it'll be good. Um, but I've also got mom and dad here with me, too. Um, dad, do you want to stand up? Just to, just to, I mean, I, I get dad to stand up all the time. <clears throat> and, uh, and mom here, too. Do you want to stand up, mom? That's okay. You don't have to if you don't want to. <clears throat> She's there beside a dad. Um, there she is. But uh, I, love my, I love my family to death. I promise that's my dad. He's 6'3 and, um, you know, weighs a little bit more than I do, but I promise he's my dad. If you don't believe that he's my dad, just look at our ears and our noses, and you'll see that they're, they're pretty similar. Um, it's funny. I posted a picture not too long ago on Instagram, and it was me, it was me and dad, and um, somebody commented on it and said, man, you're like half his size. And, um, and it's, it's true. You know, I'm, I'm a smaller version of him, but, uh, um, but I love my family to death. They're, they're incredible. Um, they're just um, really just my heroes. They've gone through a lot in life, and just the faith that they've had has been um, just, just awesome. And to see the number of people that they've affected and to see the number of people that have come to the Lord, even just through the things that they've experienced, has been something that's just, I mean, it's just worth noting and worth talking about. Uh, even people that they don't even know um, have been touched by their lives and the example that they've lived. And uh, they won't know anything about that until they get to the kingdom of heaven and see all the different people that they've touched. Um, but the Lord's done some incredible work in their lives and still doing some incredible work in their lives. Um, so just uh, thankful to have them here with us. Um, but I want to talk to you about something this morning that I, that I think is really relevant for all of us. And I want to sort of describe it uh, sort of like I did with the kids a few seconds ago. Um, and, and so it's an emotion that, that affects the way that we act. It's an emotion that affects the way that we conduct ourselves every day. Uh, it's an emotion that sort of affects the way that we relate with other people. It's something that uh, sort of at times just seems to grab a hold of our minds to where we just can't get rid of the thought of it. It's something that comes on us even in times that are great times and great seasons with the Lord. In an instant, things can change and this thing can sort of take over your mind. It happens just so quickly and, and so swiftly. It's something that's, that's not really tangible, but it's sort of a position of the mind. And it's discouragement. Have you guys been discouraged before? You've been depressed before? You've been in a place where you felt that you were absolutely alone and hopeless, and you felt incredibly discouraged? And something to note about discouragement is that a lot of times it's caused by fear. Fear of what may happen, fear of the unknown. A lot of times it's caused by some sort of doubt or some sort of disbelief. But I think that all times, and this is sort of tough to say, but it's true, I think that it's rooted in the fact that we believe that God is just not good. Many of us wouldn't say that, but when you look at discouragement, that's what discouragement is. And it's something that doesn't just affect unbelievers, it's not something that affects, or it's not just something that affects people that aren't walking closely to the Lord, but it's something that even happens to the closest of people that are walking with the Lord. Charles Spurgeon, which was a pastor at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in England years ago, and just to mention something about uh, Charles Spurgeon, this is before they had microphones to be able to amplify a voice. He pastored tens of thousands of people in this little tabernacle type place. And so part of his seminary would be uh, that they would have to measure the size of your chest to be able to see if you could project enough volume uh, to pastor people. So I, I don't think I would have gone far in seminary. Um, 
but Charles Spurgeon was a guy that, that pastored for years and has done incredible things for the Lord, uh, known as like the Prince of Preachers. But he says that, that our anxieties do not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but it robs today of its joys. And isn't that what discouragement is? It doesn't help you at all by thinking about what may happen tomorrow, but it just empties the goodness and the grace of God out of your life today. And it doesn't just happen to people like Spurgeon. He spent all of his life and all of his ministry wrestling with depression and wrestling with discouragement. But you look at people in the Bible, you look at David, who we're going to look at today, that struggled consistently with discouragement and struggled consistently with depression. I mean, you look at Elijah in 1 Kings 19, which is an incredible story. I'm not going to talk about it much today, but go back and read it. 1 Kings, it's like 17 through 19. But in this story, you've got Elijah, which is a man of God, a prophet of God that's been chosen of God to do some incredible and wonderful things. And he's been called to go to this, this place where, uh, where ultimately there's going to be this big showdown between God and the, the gods of Baal, which are like the, uh, the false gods. And so we see that, that God shows up in a great way in the life of Elijah by, uh, by Elijah building up this altar, saturating it with water, building a trench around it, filling it with water, and then watching God just send down fire on that altar, just showing how powerful he really is. And then days later, days later, not even years later, but days later after hearing about what had happened with the false gods and what had happened in that situation You see Jezebel say that she's going to go kill Elijah, and so Elijah runs for his life. And he finds himself, and he finds himself discouraged and depressed, sleeping underneath a juniper tree. Just depressed and sulking and distressed. So even moments after he has been uh, just closely and intimately acquainted with the Lord, here is this man that's struggling with depression. And that's the way that it works. It comes in quickly, even in seasons of life that we think are absolutely awesome. It can quickly change with the emotion of discouragement. And so as you go through your life and as you experience incredible mountaintop moments where you're walking hand in hand and step in step with the Lord, I know and you've seen that discouragement and depression will come in your life. So the issue is not a matter of whether or not it's going to happen, but really what are you going to do when it happens? And so I want to put forth this morning the challenge to you, and we're going to do this in just a second but to look to the Word of God. To look to the Word of God. And specifically, look to the Psalms. And as you look at the Psalms, as you read the Psalms, what you're going to see is that there are times that David is incredibly depressed, incredibly discouraged, where he's feeling alone and abandoned, but he's, he's writing out his prayers to God. And so if you're feeling discouraged and depressed and just feeling like things aren't adding up right, then look at the Psalms, read the Psalms, and even pray the Psalms just as David did. They were his prayers to the Lord. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at Psalm 13. So if you haven't turned there, turn there. Six verses, but it's packed full of incredible, incredible truth. And and what we find is that David is going to tell us three different things about discouragement this morning. Just a little bit of background about the text as we get started, though. There's no specific timeline as to when... This happened in the life of David. Uh, A lot of times you can tell when these psalms happened in his life, there's a reference to what has happened, but this psalm specifically, there's no reference. Um, But what we know is that it's a moment and a season when David's life where he's experiencing just uh, just tons of depression and discouragement. This psalm has also been called like the howling psalm because it seems like he's just whining and whining and whining. But it's also one that, that could be called like the, the how long song uh, psalm because he says how long like four different times in the first couple of verses. And, and so as we look at this psalm, we're going to see some, some great instruction from David that I think that, that you can apply to your life in those seasons of discouragement and seasons of depression. So let's, let's read the first two verses together. He says, How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord? How long? Forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? And so as you look at these two verses, what you see is that David is really just expressing the heart of discouragement. He's just laying out to us what discouragement looks like. And it's sort of awkward to read because it's almost like he's accusing God of not doing something that he should be doing. 
but you really have just an open expression of the heart of David to God. He's being honest. And I think that, that ultimately we lack so much in our prayers, not because of our failure to pray, because many of us are very consistent with that, but I think that we lack so much in prayer because we're, we're lacking honesty in prayer. We lack genuineness in prayer. We say the things that we think sound good. We go through our routine. We go through our list. We check people off that we prayed for, and we think that we're okay. And in so doing, we've sort of made ourselves just sort of lack genuineness in prayer. But here, you've got David openly and just honestly expressing his heart before God as genuine as it could be. And that's God's desire for us is that we would be honest with him with where we are. That we would be honest with the things that we have going on in our lives. That we would express ourselves before the Lord. But he says, how long? How long? And he mentions it four times in the first two verses. And because he's expressing how long, like four different times, you can guarantee that he's probably experiencing this and has experienced this for some time. You know, how long does it just come across your mind when it's been a discouraging day? But when you've had months of discouragement and months of depression where things aren't going right, then you say, how long is this going to continue? And so you know that he's experiencing anguish. You know that he's experiencing heartache, some pressure, some discouragement. And you've been in that same situation where you have maybe been in a season of life of discouragement for the past two or three years. And you wonder, Lord... How long is this going to go on? And you find yourself asking daily, Lord, how long? And even if it hasn't been that long, you know that that being in a season of discouragement, even if it's a week, you know, sometimes being in a prison for a week seems longer than a month at liberty, right? When you're confined within the walls of just discouragement and and depression, even if it's for a week or a two-week period, it seems like it's an eternity, And this is the idea that David is getting at. He says, how long? How long? And then he says, how long wilt thou forget me, O Lord? Forever? And we look at this and we say, how in the world, David, would you ever think that God would forget you? We look at David and we say, man, he was a a man after God's own heart. He was a man that was chosen by God to lead above Saul. He was a man that was chosen to kill this massive Goliath. He was a man that was chosen to do incredible things uh, for the lineage of Jesus Christ. He was an incredible man that God was going to do some awesome things through. And we look at his life and we say, David, how in the world could you accuse God of forgetting you? How could you accuse God of that? But, But don't you know when you bring that into application in our lives, we sort of fall into the same position, even though we haven't been chosen to lead a kingdom, and even though we haven't been uh, chosen to do specific things that David did, we are still, if we are his children, we are still his children. And that means for us that we will never be forgotten by God. You look at Isaiah forty nine fifteen, and this is what Isaiah says. He says, but Zion said, the Lord hath forsaken me. And so Zion was sort of saying that God had forsaken them, and they had been forgotten. And then God responds and says, can a, man for, or can a woman forget her suckling child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. And so she says, he says, even though a woman may and possibly could forget about the child that she's nursing and caring for, I am God and I will not forget my children. Hallelujah. It was true for David and it's true for you and me. You look at uh, Deuteronomy 31.6, and I'll read a couple verses to you. You don't have to worry about going there. You can write them down if you'd like. He says, Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. Why? For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Joshua 1.5, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. 1 Kings 8, 57. The Lord our God will be with us as he was with our fathers. Let him not leave us, nor forsake us. Psalm 37, 28. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. In Hebrews 13, 5. He says, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. 
So as you look at these verses, and it could go on and on and on and on, you would see the same idea that God will not forget His children. But David says, how long will you forget me? And then he goes in the second part of that verse, and he says, how long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long will you hide your face from me? There's a difference between God forgetting about David and God hiding his face from David. You know, a hidden face can still remember, you know. And sometimes you may see in your life that God will hide his face from you for a season of your life. A lot of times it's related to some sort of sin struggle that you have going on in your life that needs to come to the surface. By God removing his face from you and his favor from you and his blessing from you, it's God's way of just sort of reeling you back in. So it may look like you having some sort of health issue or some sort of financial issue or some sort of marital issue or some sort of job issue where things just don't go the way that you want them to go. And really it's God just sort of hiding his face for a period of time to bring you back closer to himself. And don't you know that it's the grace of the Lord that does that? For a child of God uh, that, that is genuinely a child of God that's experiencing the face of God being turned from their lives, it's a scary thing. It's an incredibly scary thing. And we want nothing more than to have the face of God turn towards us, but really, we can't bless sin. So for a period of time, He may turn His face away to grab our attention. And so if this is you this morning, sidebar application, if this is you this morning where you feel that God has sort of turned His face from you because of something that's going on in your life, some sort of sin struggle, then do business with the Lord today. Find yourself repentant this morning. Turn back to the Lord today and watch the favor and the blessings of God turn back towards your life. We've seen it time and time again. And for you that's maybe living in a way where you are living away from what God says is right, as a child of God, and you haven't yet experienced that turning away of God's face, then know that it's coming at some point. As a pastor, it's a scary thing, incredibly scary thing to see people of God step away from God. Because we we see it happen so often. We see it happen in families. We see it happen in people's lives where they step away from God. And we know that the chastening hand of God is right around the corner. And that's scary. And so as a pastor, you just wait for a phone call. And you know that it's going to happen. But that's God hiding his face for a season. And so he says, how long will you hide your face from me? And then he says, how long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? And what you have happening here is that David is saying that he's got sorrow just sort of filling in his heart. And the word sorrow that's used here is a word that that really means and sort of relates with the loss of someone that's close to you. So he is welling up with sorrow in his heart daily. And what this looks like and what he's saying, he's saying that uh, he has legitimately faced pressures and discouragement on the outside real things that have caused him discouragement. But in his attempt to fix those things by himself, he's created more complications for himself. It's like using this home remedy that only makes the rash worse. He's looking for resolution in other places is what he's doing. He says, how long is, he, is it going to happen? And so for David, he's trying to put out the fires that are legitimately causing him the destruction or, or legitimately causing him distress and discouragement. But now he's trying to put out the fires that he's created by fixing it himself. So they're multiplying within his heart and multiplying within his mind. And you've been there before. You've been in a place where you've been so discouraged that you've sort of taken it into your own hands to try to fix it and to make it right. And many of, it, many, many of you have experienced it leading you to substance alcohol. Maybe some of you have experienced it sort of leading you to uh, some sort of pleasure that you know that you shouldn't have, that God says is not good for you, and you've seen its destruction just sort of multiply. And even if it's not one of those extremes where you've experienced that, you've tried to resolve the issue in your mind by like replaying the situation over and over and over, trying to justify it, trying to figure it out on your own, And what you've done is that you've created just a restless mind for yourself where you go to bed and your mind cannot shut down. And you wake up with the same thoughts that you went to bed with. And you go through the same day thinking about the same thing over and over and over again until it becomes just something that you cannot get out of. 
And you wonder, how in the world has this happened for six months or eight months or a year or two years? How long will this happen, O Lord? It's where David is, where he's at. You've been there before. And then it's not long before you sort of feel as if your enemies are sort of coming over you, as he says in verse 2, how long shall my enemy be exalted over me? How long? And isn't that what discouragement is? It really just feels like you're losing. An easy way to say it. You feel like you're not winning. You feel like things just aren't going right. And really the enemy that we're fighting that he's mentioning here isn't really someone that you could take out and strangle because many of us would probably do that. Many would use a baseball bat. Some would strangle, depending on who it was, right? But he's talking about a greater enemy, right? He's talking about the enemy that we see mentioned in 1 Peter chapter 3 that says he's seeking to devour and to weigh down the believer, seeking to attack. And that's what the enemy does. He weighs you down with discouragement. He weighs you down with depression and only makes it worse and worse for you. That's what you see happen in the life of David. But don't you know, don't you know, that feeling discouraged and feeling defeated only just robs you of your joy in Christ. Robs you of being able to have joy, but also being able to share that joy with other people. It robs you from that, and it robs you from the opportunity of being able to make a difference for Him. So we see first that David sort of lays his heart out to God. He brings his emotions, he brings his discouragements to the Lord, and we should be willing to do the same thing. Bring your emotions and bring your discouragement to God. And tell God how you feel. He says in the first two verses four times, How long, O Lord? My enemies are winning. I feel like I'm losing. Lord, how long is this going to happen? But don't you know, this is what God desires for us. If you look at 1 Peter chapter, I think it's 1 Peter chapter 5. What you see is that, is that Peter says to cast all of your cares on him. Why? Because he, because he cares for you. And the ability to bring your cares before God is really to express your heart and your emotions before the Lord. So the first thing that we see is to bring your hearts and your emotions to the Lord. The second thing that we see is in verses 3 and 4. He says, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemies say I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. And so the first two verses, you see the expression of discouragement. And then in verses 3 and 4, you see the prayer of the discouraged. And so to give you a visual of what's sort of taking place, you've got David in the first two verses. You can imagine as he's crying out and just sort of laying his heart out before God, he's probably weeping. He's probably got tears running down his face. You've been there before when you've been so honest with God, where you're weeping and you're doing nothing but just expressing your heart. And then your tears begin to dry up and you begin to make a request before God. And this is what David is doing in verse 3. He says, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Now we're going to look at consider and hear me in just a second. But look at the phrase, O Lord my God. O Lord my God. So despite how difficult, despite how discouraged, despite how depressed David felt during this time, It didn't change the fact that God was still his God. And so regardless of how long your discouragement has been going on and how deep and how dark it may be in your life right now, if God is your God, he is still your God. That's something that hasn't changed. And can you imagine what it would be like for the unbeliever to go through moments and seasons of depression and discouragement? We have the Lord that we can cling to. We have God that we can call on, which is what David's doing here. But but for the unbeliever, they've got nothing. I mean, they've got their own schemes, their own devices, like David talks about in verse 2. And it's only doing nothing but leading them down to substance abuse, substance addiction, or just deeper and deeper despair. That's a scary place to be. And so he says, consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. The word that he uses for consider uh, is really uh, a word that means just to examine him, which means to look at him. So he says, look at me and hear me. And some of the most encouraging and comforting things for a person that's going through discouragement and depression is to be around the people of God. This is sort of a side note, but to be around the people of God. I've got people in my life that I can call when I'm feeling discouraged and, and just depressed that I can call on and they can consider me, they can hear me, they can understand me, and they can talk to me. 
And so for the, first, the person that feels alone and depressed, it's golden to have people that, that listen, that consider, and that hear you. But here, he's talking to God. And he says, God, you examine me. You hear me. And don't you know that God sees you and God hears you? And even in the darkest of moments that God is right there with you, He's listening, He's watching, He's guiding every, <clears throat> every step that you take. Don't you know that even when you're sleeping, He's keeping your lungs still breathing even still? Thank you, God is doing that for you. He sees you and He hears you. He says, consider and hear me. And then He says, lighten mine eyes lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. And so the, the, the Hebrew word for lighten mine eyes really means to breathe the breath of life, to breathe the breath of life. And so we can sort of understand based off of him saying, enlighten mine eyes. It means that he had gotten to a point where his despair and distress and discouragement had led him to a point where he felt like his life was going to end. And a lot of times that's what discouragement does for you and I. It leads us to a place to think that, you know what, this is the end. It leads us to thinking that there is no hope for tomorrow. It leads us thinking that we will not make it to tomorrow. That we think that our discouragement and our depression and our situation will lead us to our death. That's deep depression that David is experiencing. And he says, lighten mine eyes. It's like this fog that you can't really get out of. It's like this ability to not see clearly. It's a fog. Like if you've worn contacts before and you've had your contacts sort of fog up on you, you know that you can't really see anything. But it's like that spiritually, not being able to see clearly. And so David says to lighten mine eyes. He says a couple things similar in other verses in Psalm 6-7. He says, mine eye is consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of all mine enemies. In Psalm 38, 10, he says, my heart panteth, my strength faileth me. As for the light of mine enemies, it also is gone from me. And so his perspective had been so clouded by his discouragement that he wasn't able to see clearly. And don't you know that your perspective on every circumstance that you have will either be life-giving or life-draining? That's what David was experiencing. I mean, you can experience incredible heartache in your life, yet have good perspective and know that God will do some incredible things through it. I look at some of you guys that have experienced grief and trouble over this past year. Yet looking at your life, you've got perspective that is just out of this world. And I wonder, how in the world do these people of God have the perspective that they do, considering what they've gone through? And it's because you're able to see clearly. But I also see and have met with people that still I feel like they've been clouded and sort of foggy with the situations that are around them that they're not able to see out of it. And that's a scary place to be. And when you're that dark and when you're that low and you're that discouraged, which many of us will be there at some point in our lives, it's only the grace of the Lord that's able to remove that fog to allow us to see clearly. And it doesn't mean that he removes the situation that's causing discouragement. It doesn't mean that he removes the physical issue. It doesn't mean that he removes you from the marital trouble that you're facing. It doesn't mean that he removes you from the things that are, that are pressing on you that's making you feel discouraged. But he's just adjusting your focus. Adjusting your perspective. And David says, enlighten mine eyes so that I can see clearly. It even led him to the point of thinking irrationally. He says, uh, he says, lest I sleep the sleep of death. He's fearing death. This child of God, this man that would be a mover and shaker for the kingdom of God is a man that's fearing death. And for the believer, we know that, that there is no sting in death, right? Amen. We know that if the worst happens to us, then only the best can happen to us. Yet it's this discouragement and despair that allows us to really just fear those things that are irrational. The thing that he should have been looking forward to was creating fear in his heart because he wasn't able to see clearly. And you've been there before. You've experienced that before. And so David was saying, Enlighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. And so David is saying, God, uh, God open my eyes. Clear my perspective. And so when you're discouraged and you're depressed, what's your prayer to God? 
You express how you feel, but then you say, God, open my eyes. Lord, let me see clearly. It's the same picture that we see Paul talking about in Colossians chapter 2, and I think it's verse 3, where he's talking about having an eternal perspective on things. Not seeing things as they are here, just temporarily on earth, but being able to look beyond to see what God is doing through those things. That's what Paul is talking about. That's why he's able to say in Philippians chapter 3, uh, ultimately, that whether I live or whether I die, you know, it's for Christ because his perspective was clear. It didn't matter for Paul whether he was uh, put to, to jail or whether he was killed in jail or whatever happened to him. He was the Lord, and that's what mattered to God, or that's what mattered to Paul. It was his perspective. And so when you're going through discouragement, ask God to open your eyes. And what you'll be able to see is that he may not necessarily pull you out of the circumstance. You may still have that diagnosis. You may still be in that situation, but he can clear that perspective and remove the fog. So ask God to open your eyes. And then we see in verses 5 and 6, he says, But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord, because he hath dealt bountifully with me. As the psalm continues in these last two verses, the despair and the discouragement really don't. And what really changes is really not that, uh, that David has been removed from his circumstance, but David's faith has kicked in, right? Amen. It's kicked in. He's got it in gear there, right? His faith has kicked in. It's beginning to, to guide his emotion and beginning to guide the way that he feels. But, but look at the way that the verse sort of starts. He says, but, <laughs> but. And I know that this is probably a little bit elementary, but that's a small word, isn't it? Tiny little three-letter word. But I don't think that you can find in many verses a word that is more powerful than that word, but. If you go to Ephesians chapter 2, I just want to give you an example. We've talked about this numerous times. We've talked about it numerous times because we need to be reminded of it all the time. Ephesians 2 verse 1, we'll read through verse 4. He says, And you hath he quickened, which means he brought to life who were dead in trespasses and sins. Dead meaning that you were at the bottom of the ocean with no ability to pull yourself to the top whatsoever. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, and the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature uh, the children of wrath, even as others. And, and here we go with that word. But, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And so where you were once lost in sin, but God. He's brought you to life through his grace. So where it was once gloomy and where it was once dark, you've now got life and, and life abundantly, right? And when you look at Psalm chapter 13, you look at verse 5, it's sort of the same idea. You've got David expressing his heart before God, saying, God, I feel discouraged, I feel alone, I feel empty. But then he says, but. But I have trusted in thy mercy. So it was once gloomy and dark, but things are changing. There's a change, there's a break in the clouds, and I've got something to be grateful for. But he says, I have trusted in thy mercy. And when, I, when he says trusted, it really means that it's happened before. Amen. And so what David is looking at here, he's looking at these moments where he has experienced discouragement and depression in his life before. And he's recalling that, that God's mercy was towards him in those moments. And that he delivered him out of those moments. He says, I have trusted in thy mercy. It's something that I've done in times past. I've believed in thy mercy. And then he says, my heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I shall rejoice in thy salvation. The circumstances haven't changed, but what David is saying is that ultimately, even if things go as badly as my mind thinks that they will go, one thing that I will remain to have is my salvation. Though I lose everything that I have in the world, though I lose my life, I have my salvation. And as a believer, that's what you have to hold on to. 
And the reality is that 1 Peter tells us that ultimately everything will pass away. So at one point, at some point in the future, everything that you have will pass away. The things that we cling to, the things that cause us depression, the things that cause us discouragement, those things will be gone at some point. And all that we'll have left is our salvation. And that's all we need. And David says, I'm going to rejoice regardless because I've got my salvation. And then he says, I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. And so he's recalling periods of his life, not just where he's experienced depression and discouragement, but where he has just seen God's hand in his life over and over and over again. The reality is that, is that God has dealt bountifully with us, right? Yeah, some help please, yeah? A little bit, yeah? Not just to the degree where there is sustenance from day to day, not just where He's given you the bare minimum to make it through every day, but that He is abundantly and, and just bountifully blessing you. Let's break it down. None of us deserve life at this moment because of the thing that's within us called sin, right? None of us deserve the health that we have, even if it's poor. None of us deserve to have our lungs continuously breathing every day, but it's the Lord that keeps doing that. None of us deserves the Lord keeping our hearts beating, some stronger than others. None of us deserve the ability to be able to look and to be able to look out and to see the things that God has created. Being able to walk out this door and see the trees that God has put here beautifully for us being able to travel to various parts of the world and being able to see mountains that are absolutely incredible that God created by His hand, being able to have food and flavors and food that go well together, small thing but makes life enjoyable, right? The taste for some of you guys, good chicken, the taste of steak for some of you guys, right? The seasonings that go with that. You know, God made those things. God could have made steak bland, right? But He didn't. It's beautiful. The fact that we have families, the fact that some of us are married, the fact that some of us have incredible marriages, the fact that some of us have healthy children, jobs, finances to take care of our families, clothes on our back, a home that's paid for for some of you. Those are things that God has just abundantly blessed you with. It's not just the sustenance, it's not just the bare necessities, but it's over and above beyond what you deserve. And so that's what David is recalling, the fact that God had been uh, so abundant and so bountiful in His blessings. He's been that way for us. But he says, I will sing unto the Lord. He's not just talking about, I'm going to verbally say this to God. I'm not just going to praise God, but I'm going to sing unto the Lord. I'm going to sing. Don't you know that there's some sort of, something that happens when somebody sings? Not just when they verbally praise the Lord, but when they sing, the Spirit of God just sort of fills them. Because when you sing, you sort of just like, you throw all pride aside, you know. Whether or not you're good, whether or not you're great, you just put it aside. You don't care. Some of you guys, some, some men here don't like to sing, you know, that's okay. I get it. I don't like to sing a whole lot either. Because I'm, I'm just scared that I'm going to make some of you guys sound bad. That's why. That's why. Um, <laughs> But it's a pride thing for most people because they're afraid of the way that they're going to sound before the Lord. But David's saying that my cup is so abundantly full that I have nothing else to do but to sing. I don't really care what people think about me. I don't care what people say about me. I'm going to sing unto the Lord. I will sing unto the Lord because He hath dealt bountifully with me. So application point number three. Praise the Lord. And it doesn't happen after he's relieved from a situation. It happens while he's in his situation. During the circumstance, during his depression, during his dark days where he feels alone, he's praising the Lord. He deserves it. And don't you know that we expect to do the same thing? That's what we should do. But it's so difficult when you're in those seasons of despair and in those seasons of discouragement to be able to even like, have your eyes open to see what God is doing. Sometimes it's hard to see that. And so if it takes you being able to take a pen out and take a piece of paper out and to physically write down the blessings that God has given you so that you can praise Him for that, then do it. Amen. Carry it in your pocket. Put it on an index card. Write it on your mirror at home. Do whatever you've got to do. 
set a phone reminder. Some of you guys are techie guys to praise the Lord and to thank Him for what He's done and what He's doing. Because when you're in that season of discouragement, the only person that you seem to think about is yourself. And God is saying to, to, to focus that outward. Put, put your focus on God. To thank Him and to praise Him. And what you'll see is that as you express your heart before the Lord, as you uh, ask God to open your eyes, and as you begin to praise the Lord where you are, you'll begin to see a shift in perspective in your life. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean, listen, it's not a promise that, that, that He's going to pull you out of that circumstance. It's not a prosperity gospel that He's talking about. But He's talking about a joy in change type salvation that we are supposed to have as believers, that regardless of what you're facing, that He can give you the perspective that you need. And so that's what we're called to do as we look at Psalm 13. And so for you, where does that hit you this morning? Some of you have come in this morning with, with griefs that are absolutely unbelievable. Experiencing just heartache that many of us would never ever be able to understand. Experiencing loss, experiencing difficulty, things that just just punch you right in the gut. Make you sick thinking about it. Leaving you in seasons of discouragement and seasons of despair. But know that even in those darkest of days, you can express your heart before God. That you can ask God to open your eyes and that you can praise the Lord and God will change your perspective. Or maybe you're here and you've recently come through a circumstance where you've uh, had the fog sort of removed from your eyes and you've watched God do wonderful things in your life, then praise God for that. Praise God that He brought you through that difficulty, that despair, that discouragement. But no, around the corner, just like it was for Elijah, it could happen again. And when it happens, instructions in Psalm 13. But for the unbeliever that's here today, This is an incredibly, incredibly scary and fearful thing. Incredibly scary. Because we're as believers, we have the ability to hope in our God because He will save and sustain and strengthen. And the promise of Romans 8 that He's going to work all things for good, even if it hurts us, it's a promise that we can cling to. But for the unbeliever that doesn't have that relationship with Jesus Christ, it's a very scary place to be. And if you're discouraged and you haven't placed your faith in Christ and you're just not sure about that, you've never understood the fact that you are a sinner, you've never understood the fact that you have sin dwelling within you and you don't sin because you do bad things, but you sin because you've got something filthy within you, if you've never understood that, if you've never understood that that God made a way for you to have a relationship with Him through sending His Son to be murdered and beaten and spat on on the cross if you've never understood that simply by putting your faith in what Christ has done for you, you can have a relationship with Him, that by faith you can be a part of Psalm 13, verse 3 or 4, where He says, O Lord, my God. If you've never understood that, then I hope that today is the day. Because if you're lost and you're experiencing heartache, then there is no hope. There is nothing but destruction that's waiting you. It's driving down 85 and seeing a wreck and seeing that you're going to eventually plow right into it. It's what it is. But if you know the Lord, if you've got a relationship with Christ, if you've been saved, then your despair and your discouragement is not the end. It's not the end. It's not the end. And even if it ends as bad as you think that it will, for the believer, it's only the beginning. Did you get that? It's only the beginning. And so where does this hit you This morning, I'm going to ask that you bow your heads just for a few moments. For the believer this morning, where are you in this process? Have you expressed your heart before the Lord? Don't you know that we have one of the most incredible privileges imaginable? by being able to take our hearts, being able to take our complaints, being able to take our desires to the Lord, approaching the throne of grace, not just um, meagerly, but Lord, uh, but but in, but in, in, in boldness we can approach the throne of grace. Don't you know that we have the ability to do that? To bring your hearts to the Lord and ask God to open your eyes to remove the fog 
and praise the Lord, even if it's difficult. As you begin to look at the things that God is doing, He will abundantly just multiply those things in your mind. For the unbeliever, I fear for you. You're hopeless in this life apart from Christ. Hopeless in this life apart from Christ. Your discouragement and depression will end ugly. So won't you put your hope and your faith in Him this morning? Let's pray. Father, we thank You for um, just the chance to look at Your Word. And God, to know that it is so rich. God, it's not just words, Father, but it's life-giving. God, it's incredible, and we praise You for that. God, we thank You for the seasons of despair and discouragement that You allow us to face. God, sometimes we learn the biggest and the deepest lessons through those times, and we have nowhere else to turn but to You and You alone. So, Father, for those that are struggling this morning, God, with discouragement and depression, God, I pray that they would be real and honest, and I pray that they would be able to deal with these things in the way that you've told us to, Lord. God, they can't handle it themselves. They have to be completely dependent on you. I have to be completely dependent on you, Lord. So, God, help them to see that. And for those that are, that are lost, that don't have that relationship, God, I pray that this morning... God, that the angels would rejoice at the sound of their salvation, Father. That lives would change. And they would be able to be a part of the group that can cry out, Oh, Lord, my God. Lord, we love you. God, we thank you so much for being so good to us, for dealing with us so abundantly and bountifully, Father, in ways that we just do not deserve. Uh, Father, may you move through this invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You stand and turn to page 300 this morning.
Thank you guys for being here this morning. I'm thankful for the presence of the Lord through the Word of God. I really appreciate your attentiveness and just uh, bearing with us, so thank you for that. Um, a couple of announcements as we sort of take off. Uh, if you haven't been upstairs yet, uh, the notice that we are replastering the sides of the walls uh, where they're sort of crackling and stuff. So make sure that, um, that you're not touching the walls and that the kids aren't touching the walls even more specifically. So just guard them from that. Um, but also, if you haven't had a chance to sign up for a shirt, uh, the Just Passing Through t-shirts, we're going to be placing the order um, probably tomorrow or Tuesday. Uh, it's been up there for two weeks, so if you want to make sure to grab one of those, uh, then sign up on the list out there today. Uh, we've had probably like 80 people sign up for them, which is pretty awesome. Um, so make sure that you sign up there. It'll take a couple weeks for them to get here. Um, know that today we've got scholarship interviews starting for high school graduates, so if that affects you, then make sure that you remember to be on time, uh, high school seniors. Okay. Um, any other announcements that I'm forgetting today? Okay. Yeah, after service, uh, after we finish up here, I need a couple of men to help move this pulpit back for tonight's service. Okay. Make sure that you're here this evening. We've got the Henson girls coming in. Uh, it should be a blast, so make sure that you are a part of that. All right. If there are no other announcements, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Keith to close us in prayer, if you will. <laughs> 